Last week we started a new mini-series based on the parable of the prodigal son. And we learned that this was not some random thought bubble that had occurred to Jesus on the spur of the moment. It was a response to some self-righteous mumblings by the scribes and Pharisees who were outraged that this so-called rabbi teacher spent his time with sinners even so far as to enter their houses and eat with them. As we saw at the beginning of the passage, then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, and we go on to it. So he went on to tell them the parable about the lost sheep, then the lost coin, and then he hit them with the big one, the lost son, or as we commonly refer to it, the prodigal son. As we saw last week, the youngest son effectively slaps his father on the face when he asks for his share of the inheritance. It was sort of like saying, I wish you were dead. If this sort of behaviour wasn't shocking enough, the father says, OK, if that's what you want, I'll die for you. Here's your share of the inheritance. That's really bizarre when you think about it, isn't it? When someone says, I wish you were dead, nobody responds by saying, OK, I'll die. But the father did. And then the son added insult to injury by leaving family and home and going to a far country. And those are all big no-no's in Middle Eastern culture. To, to, to waste his father's hard-earned money on drinking parties and sex. Now eventually he wakes up in a pigsty and realises that life is terrible. So he returns home to beg for a position among the hired servants. And when the father sees him come and he ran out to meet him, again the father shamed himself with such behaviour. Middle Eastern landowners did not run. Running was for servants. Why run when you've got a servant who can run for you? In running to his son, the father showed once again that he only cared about his son. He doesn't care about himself. He's willing to act like a servant for his son. When the father saw this, he, sorry, when the son sees this, he realises that his father will never, never let him be a servant. So he simply confesses his sin. Note that he is already forgiven before he confesses. The father's already run to him to greet him and welcome him back. He was forgiven before he confessed. Forgiveness doesn't follow confession, but it precedes it. Now let's finish the story. So the father is so glad the son is home, he throws a party for this son who's returned. And now comes the older brother. And he, well, rightfully, would that be the right word? Wonders why a party is being thrown for this wayward son who shamed the family name, insulted their father and squandered his inheritance. And then he does exactly the same thing. He shames himself and grossly insults his father by refusing to go in. He, wait, he makes it even worse by not, ref, not addressing him as his father. He denies his brotherhood by referring to the younger as this son of yours. Right? Not my brother, this son of yours. Furthermore, he does not even think of himself as a son, but has been working like a slave. You know, the father says, we've been together this whole time and everything that's left is yours. But my son who was dead is now alive and that deserves a party. You know, we 
would like to think that that would be the end of the story. But I'm going to mess with your heads a bit. Right? It's fun. <laughs> Messing with your heads. The parable of the lost son is not really the last parable in the sequence. What parable is that? Well, it's the parable of the one. So Jesus went from one in a hundred lost sheep, one in ten lost coins, one in two the younger son to complete the sequence. It's the one of one, which is simply the one. And who is the one? It's the second half of the story, isn't it? It's the older son. And note that the parable of the prodigal son ends with the father speaking to the older son. But we do not hear how the older son responds. We do not know if the older son goes into the party or if he continues to sit outside in the dark having a little pity party of his own. You know, really, as the father said, everything now belongs to the older son anyway. For we all know that maybe the older son threw a party for himself, who knows? Why shouldn't he? It's all his anyway. And when the father says, everything I have is yours, it's almost as if the father was saying, you want a party? Great, let's have one. Since you own everything, go ahead, you know. Let's party some more. But Jesus doesn't tell us. He doesn't tell us. Why not? Why does the third parable in this sequence have no ending? Why do we not hear what the older son says? Why does Jesus leave us hanging as to what's happening? See, last week I was easy on you because everyone, everyone knows they're not the younger son, don't they? Yeah. Ouch. Prepare yourselves. I would suggest because the rest of the story is ours. The one of one, the number one is you and me. The prodigal son has no ending because we are invited to end it. If we identify with the older son in Luke 15, then we're invited into the story to provide its ending. So you're either one or the other. You're either the prodigal son, the, the, the sinner, the gross sinner who went away then came back and repented. Or you're not. You're the older son. And the father is now speaking to us and saying, Son, you're always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Now the ball is in your court. Are you going to come party and play or continue to sit outside? You know, that's not an easy question to answer, is it? So there are three things that we older sons can learn from the parable of the prodigal son. I'm going to mess with your heads a little bit more too. There is no older son. This is the hard one. I believe that when all is said and done, we will discover that there's no such thing as an older son. In other words, you and I think we're older sons, but we're not. We're just prodigal sons who've not yet woken up in the pigsty. Oh, we're in that far country and our want and living looks different than it did for our younger brother. But we are lost sons nonetheless. Our particular form of wayward living has a decidedly religious bent. We don't spend our inheritance on sex, drugs and alcohol. We spend our energy and our life on criticising others and feeling that we're more spiritual than them. One of the main truths of the parable of the prodigal son is that everybody is a lost son. Some of us just haven't woken up to it yet. 
Furthermore, the elder son is the worst kind of lost son. Because we think we have stayed with God our Father, when in the reality we've got into the far country of religion, which allows us to look down our self-righteous noses at everybody else, who's not good enough, smart enough or committed enough to truly live for God. Just like those Pharisees. There's no one like that here, is there? No one here would be like that. We're all nice people. Remember what Jesus said to some of his onlookers. He says, I've not come to call the righteous, but the unrighteous. Here's the translation. You're all unrighteous. Some of you just don't know it yet. Those of you who think you're righteous are the worst kind of unrighteous because you're only religiously righteous. Mm. While most of us think that Jesus came to rescue us from sin, I think the Gospels seem to show pretty clearly that Jesus is concerned, is as concerned about those of us trapped in religion as he is about those trapped by sin. You know, religion is an invisible prison. It makes us think we're okay from God when we may actually be further from him than the greatest of sinners. Sinners typically know they're sinning. Religious people never do. I went through a bit in my life when I thought I was righteous. We have a bit of trouble seeing the speck in our own eye, don't we? Eh? We have a bit of trouble seeing the speck in our own eye. Exactly. <laughs> in the Gospels, when you think about it, the sinners are little more than a side note. We don't see much of them. Right? The real focus of Jesus' interaction is with the Pharisees and the religious leaders. They are there every time he opens his mouth. They're there every time when he heals someone <coughs> or ministers. <coughs> Whenever sinners are mentioned, in fact, it's usually in the context of setting up a discussion between Jesus and the religious people. Why is this? Well, it's because Jesus came to rescue us from religion. Sin is a big deal for God. We know that. He sent his son to pay the price for our sin, but religion? Oh, that's something else he's really concerned with. And that's the deal with the older son. He thinks he's better than his brother because he stuck around with dad. But he's not necessarily better for he is judging and condemning his brother, whom the father has already accepted and forgiven. The older son is a lost son as well. And he too has turned away from his father. So the parable of the prodigal son should be called the parable of the prodigal sons. They're both prodigal, but in different ways. Point two. Parties are only for repentant prodigals. Notice that parties are never thrown for the rebellious sinners or for the religiously self-righteous. Neither one gets a party so long as they are caught in those two types of traps. The younger son only gets his party when he realises how much he's mucked up and how much his father loves and forgives him. And that's when the party begins for him, isn't it? Logically then, the older son will get a party too when he realises how much he has mucked up and how much his father loves him and forgives him too. So that's when he'll get his party. So death always precedes resurrection. Until there is death, there can be no resurrection. What did the father say to the elder son? My son was dead and is alive again. Right? Death always precedes resurrection. The younger son died and has risen to new life. The older son has yet to recognise he's just as dead. The 
when he does, there will be life for him as well. If, like me, you feel like the oldest son, then our prayer should be this, Father, show me how I am the younger son. Only then will the party begin, as we see the religious clothes that we put on, the way we live our life. You know, it is possible, isn't it, that we never fully come to this realisation. We may never get the party, or more likely, we may never feel like we get the party. In that case, here's what will happen. We will reach the end of this life and die. There's our death. It's actual. And when we arrive in heaven and stand before Jesus, you know, I sort of imagine myself as something like this. Is Pastor Peter reporting for duty, sir? I've lived my whole life for you and for your glory, and now I'm ready to live my eternal life in your service. What are my responsibilities in the eternal kingdom so that I might begin to serve you forever? Yeah. And based on what I read in this story, I think Jesus will look at me with a half smile on his face and a twinkle in his eye and say, since you have been faithful in a few things, I will make you faithful in many. Do I ever have an assignment for you? Come with me. <laughs> and he'll lead me down the steps of the throne room and to a secret door behind the throne. Then he will invite me to open the door and as I step through, all my family and friends from this life will jump out and shout, Surprise! <laughs> Welcome home. Somebody will throw a robe on my back, put shoes on my feet, and Jesus himself will put a glass of wine in my hand and will smile and say, Duty, responsibility, service, there's none of that here. Now is the time to party and this one is in your honour. For you were dead and are now alive again. So even if you and I don't get the party in this life, there's going to be a party for us too. In the meantime, we can continue doing what only we can do. And if that's serving to the best of your ability and working hard and living responsibility, sorry, responsibly and making wise choices, and living on a budget, that's wonderful. Yeah. Just don't look down on others who seem not to be able to live up to such standards, for whatever reason. The father loves both sons, point three. But the older son gets something special. Here is the third point which in my opinion is the most beautiful of all. Note that in the end, the only thing the father has for the, others, the older son is the only thing he has for the younger son, pure, unconditional love. God does not love you any more or any less than the younger sons who are out there. He loves and accepts you both the same. Nevertheless, there is something that you have with God that the younger son does not. It does not make you better or more special or anything of that sort. But there are benefits to living the way you do. And in the parable, the father reminds the older son about them. You remember, the father says to the older son, you are always with me. When it comes right down to it, why have you lived responsibly? Why do you try to make smart choices with your money, your time and your resources? Why do you always try to please God and do what he wants? I think if you're honest with yourself, it's because you love God and you want to be with God. And what does the father say to the older son? You are always with me. Do you hear the tenderness in that? The love? The relationship? The younger son went away to a far country 
the younger son lost year upon year of relationship with his father. We don't know how many years passed in those two verses of Luke 15, verses 13 to 15. I think that's three verses. But for the son to spend all his money and for a severe famine to come upon the land, we're looking at probably at least a decade, ten years. Typically a severe famine takes several years to develop, doesn't it? But during all that time, the father and the older son enjoyed conversation over everyday meals, working side by side in the fields, laughing at each other's jokes and supporting each other through the trials of life. There never was any party, but ten years of memories with his father are probably worth more than the most splendid party of all time when you get down to it, isn't it? People who live large portions of their lives apart from God still get the same love and forgiveness from God that we all get. They still get the party, but they don't get the memories. They don't get the history. They don't get the relationship that comes only with building a relationship through time and through trials. And this fellowship is worth more than any number of parties. Think about it. If you could rewrite your life, what would you choose? You know, first you could go with what you have now, the relationship with God, and you have now through years of sticking by him and struggling with questions and fears and fighting off temptation and making wise decisions that sometimes turn out to be not so wise, and persevering through temptation and learning what you know about God, scripture and theology, but ending up as a relative nobody in churchianity, just someone who is part of a church family, just sits in the seat every week faithfully. Or you could take all that and you could trade it for the story of someone who slept around, did drugs, got divorced four times, murdered somebody, landed in jail, found Jesus, got paroled, and then became an internationally, internationally known Christian author and conference speaker. Even though they lived most of their life with no thought for Jesus. Would you trade your life for this one? No, I don't think so, I wouldn't. My life is not glamorous or glorious. It doesn't have the ups and downs or the highs and lows of other people's life. I often get jealous of people who strike it rich with book deals and conference invitations, who get parties and the fame because they were bad but now they found Jesus. But then I look back over my life at how far Jesus and I have walked together and what we have been through together and how we've suffered and grieved and rejoiced and laughed together. And I realised that no book deal, no bank account or applause from men could ever substitute for what I have with Jesus. And as I believe the richness of our friendship will only increase as I continue to walk with him through the thick and thin of life. If you feel like the older son in the parable of the prodigal son, I believe the same is true of you. You see things and know things that few other people know. And this is due in large part to the fact that you've stuck with Jesus when many others have wandered off to the far country. Keep hanging out at home with your father. It may not be glamorous, but it is good. It's very good. So the parable, to conclude this message, is about the extravagance of God's love and forgiveness. John McKinnon comments that it gives wonderful insights into the heart of God. Effectively, Jesus was teaching that God's forgiveness was wild and beyond reason, shameless and irresponsible, unconditional and uncaused, spontaneous but profound, mother-like and father-like, life-giving and freeing, irrepressible and celebratory.
In the parable, Jesus is addressing the religious elites. He wants them to understand that including the downcast in no way reduces God's love for them. The parable also addresses us. It's not just about God's forgiveness of sinners, but about our treatment of sinners and the marginalised. Which feast are you refusing to join? The parable invites us to finish the unfinished story by drawing close to those we may be tempted to exclude in all the different areas of our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to move across to the communion table now.